Hallelujah. Just um, for somebody maybe in here or somebody who's watching by live stream um, or someone who may even watch this on demand, um, something you're dealing with, something you may be going through, but make sure you're listening in your spirit. Make sure you're listening in your spirit and not your head. Make sure you're listening in your spirit and not your head. Be led of the spirit. The sons of God are led by the spirit of God. So God did give us a brain and God did give us wisdom and we use our brain to reason. And there's nothing wrong with things that make sense. Absolutely. But something that uh, you're trying to navigate right now, make sure you're listening in your spirit to what to the voice of the Lord, to what the Lord is saying, what the spirit of God is expressing in your spirit and lead, lead with that, lead with that. Make sure it aligns with the word, but lead with what God is speaking to your spirit and in your spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Good morning. It is, I consider it an honor to be with you again to break open or open the word and share what God has put on my heart um, in this new facility, new place, but still, same anointing, right? We all have God's anointing in us, and I am so thankful for that. We are going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We'll start with it and end with it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And I will read. Here's the word of the Lord. It says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this morning I want to spend some time talking about praying with confidence. It's where we will be. So with that, let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful time that we can come together and open up your word. Father, we know that you have a word in season for us, your people. Encourage us, uh, incite us for good works, Father. Show us uh, your truth, Father. We know that your Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth, Father. So we just declare a blessing and uh, anointing on the hearing of your word, Father. Thank you, Lord, that I can speak as the oracles of you, that out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. Uh, I thank you that we are all anointed to hear your word and that we all receive something from you this morning, Father. Thank you. It is good. To be at House of the Lord, um, I am. I always like to start uh, give a frame of reference for where we're we're going. And but before I do that, I'm reminded of uh, Pastor Jim used to always tell us: if you don't quit, you win. Right? If you don't quit, you win. And some of us may be in a season of life where we are pressing, <laughs> uh, where we are pressing through. Uh, I remember. Um, playing basketball. I didn't get to play as much as uh, some of y'all. Uh, I know uh, Pastor Brian played and Pastor John got to play with Ray Jackson. I just got to sit in the stands and watch Jimmy King, but it's another story. Uh, anyway, I, I, I digress a little bit. Tried out for that basketball team and they told me I was too short. Don't ever let them tell you you two something, right? Um, but I just remember uh, when I played for church league and, you know, you play defense, and you play offense, defense, offense, and you go back and forth. There was always that point in a game where it's like, okay, now we go on full court press. I was like, ooh, <laughs> I don't like that full court press because uh, now you got to play the whole court. It wasn't just, you know, be on defense, then run and be on offense. It's no, you're going to play defense the whole, <laughs> the whole situation. Um, and sometimes we come in life feeling like, okay, we on full court press. <laughs> like, can we take a break? Where's my subs? Where's the timeouts? Where is such and such? Lord Jesus, help. 
And some of y'all may be feeling that, and, and so we approach this. Uh, even as we look at this, we're going to uh, see some of that uh, pressure uh, in the Word that uh, people have, have gone through. And uh, I start off with uh, Hebrews chapter 14, verse 6, Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of need, or at the time of our need. And... Um, I remember in the old school uh, cartoons, they don't have, um, well, I have watched cartoons in a while, but in old school cartoons, they always had this uh, theme or the word of the day. I used to, you know, something to focus on, and I would say that today the word of the day is going to be confidence. We're going to see that in, in the scriptures, but uh, that's going to be our word of the day. And I want to start off by giving you some, um, I don't know, Talk of the, the times or the seasons that we're in. Um, this past week, of course, uh, we had on Tuesday, it was Valentine's Day. And uh, Wednesday, it was Ash Wednesday. And a lot of churches have started uh, the season of Lent. Um, it's what we know as, uh, what, what we hear in the church is fasting a time of uh, fasting. And Lent uh, is usually uh, this uh, solemn religious uh, time period uh, for some churches. Uh, it con- commemorates the 40, um, the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness being tempted by uh, the devil. And originally when Lent was set up, it was uh, two days, if you will. Two days uh, right before, uh, or two or three days right before uh, Resurrection Sunday. And at some point, the church, when I say the church, I don't know which specific denomination, but um, several of them, they decided, we're going to make this the 40 days prior to Resurrection Sunday. So they back up 40 days, and it's always, of course, on a Wednesday, because Resurrection Sunday is always on a Sunday. So you back up, you end up, just simple math, that's all, simple math, you back up and you end up on Wednesday, so it's Ash Wednesday, Uh, you go to some churches, they put the sign of the cross with the ashes on your forehead, and everybody knows, you ain't even got to be in church, you give up something, right? It's no longer necessarily fasting of food, water, whatever the case may be, Uh, people come together and they... Give up something. And I remember people talking, what are you giving up? What are you giving up? What you? It was like this, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a game, but it was something. And I think it uh, had lost what it was. Uh, anyway, we won't get into that. But um, I want to look at this, uh, what it was taken from, uh, see if we can glean some things. So let's go to Matthew chapter 4. talking about this time that Christ spent fasting in the desert, enduring temptation by Satan. Uh, We'll see this in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He did this before beginning his public ministry. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, says, Then Jesus, or then Yeshua, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and says to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus says to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, If you fall down and worship me, then Jesus says to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the Lord, or excuse me, then the devil leaves him and behold, angels came 
and began to minister to him. That is this occurrence in the gospel according to Matthew. Now let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 1, and we see coverage here in just two verses, not 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says, Immediately the spirits impelled him to go into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. So already in these two accounts, we see that, uh, first of all, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. That will mess with some people's doctrines. Because <laughs> we want, uh, you know, always to be led to the, the, the fountains and the, the waterfalls and the, the beautiful lush Garden of Eden, wherever that may be represented in your life. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will take us in a direction where we go through wilderness. That is not fun. And I just, uh, I, I like Mark's be, um, portrayal of this incident because, well, one, he just condenses everything because that's not his focal point when he's writing his gospel but of all the things that he talks about, uh, if it's not bad enough, he shares in his gospel, there was wild beasts. <laughs> that Jesus had to deal with some, you know, we, we think of him, and we got this picture of him leaning against a rock, and the sun shining through, and him praying, and this beautiful picture, and Mark says, hey, he was not only led into this, but there was some wild beasts that were around that he had to deal with. So if hunger wasn't enough, imagine uh, something out there trying to get at you, right? Look at Luke, his portrayal. Luke trying to put all this together, and he covers it in 15 verses. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was around by the Spirit in the wilderness. It says here, full of the Holy Spirit. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you know, we think that there's places you're not going to go because you are full of the Holy Spirit. And yet, where does he go? The wilderness. He was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding excuse me, district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So again, another account, uh, this is Luke's account of that particular setting and what was going on. Um, the spirits uh, led him there, and of course he's uh, tempted by the devil. And I want you to notice in these accounts, particularly in Matthew's account and Luke's account, what did the devil tempt Jesus with? The Word. And we think it's enough to know the Word. We've got to know the Spirit behind the Word. That's very, very, very 
important. When uh, Brian got, uh, Pastor Brian got up and he said, hey, you need to be led by the Spirit. It's, it's important to be in tune with the Spirit of God. This is why it's so important. The devil wasn't leading with or tempting him with the Spirit of the Word. He was tempting him with the letter of the law. And in the same way, you as a believer, me as a believer, if we don't know the spirit behind the word, then we can be led astray. Y'all understand? You know, I tell people this, um, and you've heard me say this uh, if you've been around me for quite a while. The world has this picture of the devil as uh, this uh, red thing, horns, tail, whatever. And yet my Bible says that the devil walks around masquerading as an angel of light. See, the, the red thing with horns and a tail, that's not deceiving. That's just in your face trying to cause fear. What the enemy is after is deceiving you into following something else. What did he do in the Garden of Eden with um, Eve? Adam and Eve. He said, well, God knows that if you eat of it, then you would become like him. And he even added to what God had told them. So understand that he works by deception. And so if you're going to go toe to toe with the devil and think you know more word than him, that's probably not uh, the best option you want to take <laughs> in a battle, right? You want to go by something that he doesn't have, and that is the Spirit of God. How did, G you know, we say that uh, Jesus responded with the Word, and so we think, you know, that's, you know, that's how he did it. He responded with Scripture. Well, it wasn't Scripture against Scripture. It was Scripture against the Word in Scripture, or the Spirit in Scripture. There's a difference, you understand. Uh, you've heard Pastor Jim talk over and over about how um, Adam O'Hare, uh, leader of the atheist movement, knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, and she would come and argue with those uh, men of faith or people of God, arguing that there is no God with the scriptures. Like, how does that, like, what? <laughs> if there is no God, why are you even studying the scriptures? Because she knew what she wanted to know what they knew and wanted to uh, combat them and show them the errors in their logic if they didn't have a good sound um, synopsis of the word or led by the spirit. So all that's uh, extra. But uh, what I want to show here is, you know, this is what the setting was for or what the church has taken as the setting for Lent these 40 days leading up to Resurrection Sunday. They also go back and look at Moses. Uh, Moses, in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. And let's look at verse 28. Um, and if you back up, you'll see in chapter 34, this is when Moses gets the two tablets again. Y'all remember what happened with the first two? They broke. <laughs> well, he dropped them. Why? Because these people were making a calf. Um, so we get into verse 34. Goes back up, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 34, verse 28 says, So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. I want to uh, give you a little bit more context. There's a lot in here, but um, I'm going to back up, if we can, all the way to... Exodus chapter 19, I want to bring something out in this passage. Exodus chapter 19, verse 23, uh, 
he's getting he got instructions from the Lord. He's up at Mount Sinai. This is where he got the Ten Commandments. He of course goes back up again. He gets them again. But uh, we know from this account that uh, he has face to face conversation with the Lord. And in verse twenty three. It says, Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Uh, and so when we look at Mount Sinai, the people weren't allowed. It was just Moses, the prophet of God, that was able to approach God. We know in the New Covenant Church that the veil has been rent from top to bottom. We all now have access. Before, the people did not have access to God. There wasn't personal relationship as we have nowadays, and that becomes very, very important, particularly when you're talking with other uh, people who may have other beliefs, religions. Uh, we're one of the few, if the only, that uh, says that you can have a personal relationship with God. And so we won't get off into that, but it's important to understand that this is what... Uh, Jesus, of course, offered is for us to have personal relationship. Go to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. Laying a foundation here so we understand a little about Lent. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. This is Elijah now. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. If you look at the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 19, you'll see that this is a point where Elijah is fleeing from Jezebel. So he's fleeing, he needs to get away, he's going to the mountain of God, and he spends 40 days and 40 nights there to hear from and spend time with God. So, all of that to give you background to why uh, they uh, expanded Lent to be this 40-day period, right? This period of consecration, this period of um, getting prepared, if you will, for the resurrection. And this is done by uh, the Roman Catholics, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, just to name a few. Not every church does it. So if you run into people who are uh, experiencing Lent, you have some background now. Now I'm going to teach you how to engage with those folk, because one of the things that we see in Scripture is that uh, we are all to be unified and one. You now know the basis for why they do what they do, um, so you can have dialogue, but let's get in further. Uh, three reasons that you'll see the church perform Lent. Uh, one is to um, be caught up in prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Those are the three reasons. Let's look at what Jesus said about it. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 through 15. The disciples of John. Who's John? It's John the Baptist. Not Pastor John. This is the disciples of John the Baptist. They came to him. Who's him? Jesus. They came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And what was their response? Or what was his response? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So right here we see that uh, there's an element of, um, in this fasting, if you will, an element of mourning or grief, if you will, of, of having lost something. And yet Jesus says, well, the disciples are with me, so why would they fast? They're with me. That's deep right there. That's very, very deep. Because one of the, well, I'm jumping ahead. Let's go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. That's deep. Mark chapter 2. He makes it even plainer. Uh, verse 18 through 20. 
John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they come and say to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So we see here, there's a picture that fasting is for when Jesus is away. Right? All right. Y'all are with me. Okay. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 33 through 35. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So I gave you, just because I'm going to say some things that <laughs> uh, come directly from Scripture, and I wanted you to see it in several places. Jesus points out that there is no reason to fast if he is with you. Y'all see that? He said the attendants do not fast, or, the, you know, if they're with the groom. And so I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, one of the reasons that uh, we fast is if we feel distant from the Lord. It's not that he's distant from us, if we feel distant from the Lord. It's the way to get out distractions or anything else that could be hindering or blocking that relationship, that distance that we feel. That is what it's all about, not what's, of course, practiced today. Um. Matthew chapter 6, verse, let's go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Jesus had just talked to his disciples about prayer and how to pray. And he says, verse 16, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So here we see Jesus talking to the disciples and he tells them when you fast. So what does that mean? That means he knows that they are going to, right? If he says whenever you fast or when you fast, that means, hey, I know this is something you're going to do. He did it. He knew predecessors did it. Um, this is how you approach it. And he goes on um, telling them, you know, don't uh, make it look like you're fasting. Oh, man, I'm just... I'm just going through. I just want y'all to know I haven't eaten since, you know, two weeks ago. And uh, just pray for me. I'm going through and this and that. And, you know, we want to brag about what we're fasting and doing and all of this stuff. And Jesus says, don't even let people notice. This is between you and the Lord. You're getting closer to God. Um, I want to simplify because uh, many times we think, with this Lent thing, people get off, um, they want to give up something, and anyway, um, let me tell you simply what fasting is. Fasting is prayer with much more concentration. That's it. It's prayer with greater concentration. A lot of times we like to make things a little bit more um, theological than things are, and that's simply what it is. Now, uh, I'm going to say something else that <laughs> may mess with some of you, but it's, again, from scriptures we read. 
the closer you feel to Christ, the less you will feel the need to fast. Y'all see that in Scripture. Because he said, hey, if I am with you, because they, the, the John the Baptist and the, the, well, John the Baptist's disciples came and said, hey, we do it, Pharisees do it, why don't your disciples do it? He plainly said, well, because I'm right here with them. <laughs> so they don't need to do it. It's only if I'm away that they would need to do it. So that is um, one thing that we see here. Um, it is a matter of trying to get closer to God, have greater concentration. We have a promise in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, that says that he will never leave us or forsake us. A wonderful promise that you and I as believers have, and yet we don't necessarily always feel that, right? And so we'll want time to get closer because something is off, you know? It's kind of like the the couple, husband, wife, and, you know, they uh, the pressures of life, the, the busyness, whatever it is, uh, gets in the way of things. And so they say, you know what? We need to take a break. We need to go have a vacation, just you and I, right? It's that closeness. That's what it's all about. Lord, I want to have a um, close, closer relationship with you. Something is off, and I don't know what it is. So I'm going to press in and get closer. This is what um, God is, is after, is that closeness um, for us to have with him. Now, let me give you a second reason that uh, the new church, the new covenant church did it. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. Thank you, Father. It says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, one of the second reasons that you'll see in New Covenant for fasting is when there's big tasks or decisions to be made or done. All right? So, we see it as a way to get close with our Father. We also see it here as... Hey, we're doing something big, if you will. We want to make sure we're, we're doing this right. And so they're pressing in. Before they set aside uh, Barnabas and Saul, it says that they were praying and fasting. Uh, the two generally uh, went together with uh, the New Covenant Church. Look at Acts chapter 14. So turn one more chapter over. Verse 21 of Acts chapter 14 says, uh, is that... Oh, 13 is a long chapter. Got to turn two pages. Um, verse 23, I'm sorry, verse 21 says, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Verse 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So this second element, again, we see it here. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So here we see this other incidence of fasting and why they did it. It was to get closer uh, or to uh, make some decisions in regards to 
the ministry. So again, we know what uh, fasting is, prayer with greater concentration. We see instances of why we do it. Um, in the New Covenant Church, it was to make some big decisions or do some things. Um, believe it or not, this message is not about fasting. It's about praying with confidence. It doesn't matter, well, to me it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me how you get there as long as you get there. Whether it's spending time in God's word, whether it's praying, whether it's praying and fasting, the goal is pressing to get closer to God by any means necessary. If that means you've got to subject some things in your life, if I've got to subject some things in my life to get closer, that is the most important. We just went through a period, and I was talking to you about um, you know, fasting from disobedience or uh, fasting from delay or fasting from distractions. All of those things we need to get rid of as we're pursuing what God has for us. Uh, so the ultimate goal is for us to have close relationship with God regardless of how you do it. I want to look at our Redeemer. I'm going to give you several scriptures pertinent to Jesus' prayer life so you can see him in operation. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says here, in the early morning while it was still dark, what did Jesus do? He got up left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. says, Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and do what? How, what does it say as far as uh, when he would do it? it? says often, right? It says he would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Now, he is the son of God. And we see in John chapter 17, he talks about how he and the father are one. And yet this is what he did, Right? So if he did it, what do you think that means for you and I? We should be pursuing just like he did. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, this, is a, this is a tough one. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Y'all see that? That's not fun, because I love my sleep. Y'all ever had those times where you're, um, well, I, I asked a question, I already know the answer. Uh, when you're asleep, and you all of a sudden wake up, middle of the night, and you just don't know why, and you feel like you should be doing something, but you don't, so you try to go back to sleep. A lot of times, it's because God wants you in prayer. Remember, uh, Pastor Brian talked earlier about um, following after the Spirit. Things may not make sense in your head, but hey, I know I woke up for a reason, so I'm going to pray this out. Whatever it is, I'm going to pray with understanding. I'm going to pray in the Spirit, but I'm just going to pray. There is a reason, and it's uh, not because you had pizza the night before that you may have woken up in the middle of the night, right? God sometimes um, wakes you up because, one, it's silent and he can reach you and I. Um, two, because he trusts you to spend time with him and pray. So don't just um, block those moments off. Now, Matthew chapter 26 
talking about praying with confidence. Matthew chapter 26, verses 39. Give me lots of scripture. Oh, this is a good one. And he went a little beyond and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, uh, actually, let me back up. Verse 38. Let me go to 36, sorry. This is good stuff. Then Jesus uh, comes with them to a place called Gethsemane and says to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he, takes, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Um, if I can uh, add this, that um, sometimes we think when we go through grief or distress that, there's, um, that we're inadequate as believers. And I love the fact that God put this passage in our scriptures because it shows that Jesus went through some grief and distress. For the scriptures to say, and we'll get to this in Hebrews chapter 4, I think verse 15, it says that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all regards as we are. We have here, it says he was grieved and distressed, and he says to them, my soul, he even tells the disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he comes to the disciples and finds them sleeping and says to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Uh, again, I love this passage because it uh, flies in the face of some people's theology. Um, if you pray the same thing or you repeat the same things, then you are not in faith. Well, that don't line up with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus prayed the same thing. Not only that, but he was trying to get his will to line up with the Father's. Because that was most important to him. So don't let the enemy or people around you say, well, you are just not in faith. or you don't, They don't know you. They're not living your life. They're not going through what you are going through. Stop letting people be like those who are around Job, telling him all of this nonsense. You get with God and let God tell you what for, right? People will, oh, yeah, I'm just going to let people, I'm going to move on from there. Um, understand, Jesus prayed the same thing three times. Not only that. But uh, he kept uh, wanting his disciples to be up there and, and pray with him. And what were they doing? Sleeping. Um, can you outsource prayer? Well, that's a trick question. Yes and no. Scriptures do tell us that we can go to one another for prayer. And I've got several scriptures uh, that talk about that. You can write these down. James chapter 5, verse 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Luke chapter 6, verse 28, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, 1 John 5 and 16, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, Galatians 6, 2. These are all scriptures that uh, give us or admonish us to pray for others. So, yes, you can outsource prayer, but you can't outsource relationship. And that's two different things. And prayer with God is about relationship. I can't, uh, there have been times where I've uh, asked some people, whether it was, you know, those in my sphere of influence who are close to me, hey, pray for me, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, uh, pray for me, um, and they'll gladly do it, and it helps, because it's, the scripture says in James chapter 5, verse 16, I believe, that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And so I trust my brothers and sisters to pray for me and cover me, and that uh, there's going to be in part um, to me, and that things are going to go well because of that prayer. So yes, in that regard, you can 
pray for others, or you can ask others for prayer. However, that doesn't build your relationship and your oneness with the Father. We can't outsource that. We can get help in time of need, but we can't outsource personal relationship with the Father. Hebrews, that brings us to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the scripture that we started with. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let me flip back there. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace of help in time of need. What is the context of this passage? It is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted. What does it say right after that? In all things. He faced pressure. He faced temptation in all things, yet it says, without sin. He is our example. There's a passage in Ephesians. I'm going to share a few more because we're talking about praying with confidence. A big part of our confidence knows that we, are, uh, we have a high priest who knows what we're going through. We're talking about a personal Lord and Savior. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. If you go back to Hebrews and go to chapter 10, verse 35 through 36, it says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, oh, notice it says, when you have done the will of God. So there's some uh, obedience that we've got to do, right? When you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You know, it's kind of ludicrous to expect things uh, when God tells us, okay, this is how to make that, you know, come to fruition in your life, and then you and I don't do it, right? We've got to be obedient to the things he tells us to do. First John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to what? His will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we have asked from him. So praying with confidence, it involves having this close relationship that we uh, know that there's nothing um, in between God the Father and ourselves, that uh, there's no uh, nothing that's keeping us from experiencing the fullness that he has for us. This is the level of intimacy that God is calling us to and that's how we get to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. I'll go back to this. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Grace is available even if you don't do everything right. Mercy is available even if you don't do everything right. Don't let anything in between you and that throne room. Pray often. Uh, there's a passage that says, uh, it's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. It says, pray continually. God is calling us as believers to have that intimacy with Jesus our Lord through prayer. Amen.